Hi, everybody. Um, I am Renee Ornelas, and I've been living in Fort Defiance for the last six years, having come here from Albuquerque, New Mexico. My mother's from Benjamo, Guanajuato, Mexico, and my father is from Chihuahua, Mexico. My maternal grandparent, my maternal grandfather is from Chihuahua, Mexico, and my paternal grandfather is from Chihuahua, Mexico. My mother and father uh, were raised in Los Angeles, California, married, and that's where I and my three brothers were raised. And that's who I am as a not Pai woman. Um, I want to recognize that I am here on the Diné Nation in Fort Defiance, Arizona. I wanna recognize this as the ancestral lands of the Diné people and that it's an honor to be here, a privilege and an honor to be here. So um, I'm gonna start this presentation with a video because the video uh, goes over child sexual abuse, it, more specifically here on Navajo Nation than, you know, than all tribal communities. But there are some presenters in the video that talk about this problem across the country. So, um, and, and you will meet some people in this video that I work with here. So, and this video was done by the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism. And I think it's a great way to lead into a topic like this. Oh, hang on. Let's let the video come up. One day he came from the north side and I was outside feeding the goat bottle. And after I did that, I went to she corral and did some more feeding over there. They were both walking that way and they said, pick the girl up in 20 minutes or 30 minutes and that to turn off and that never happened. We called the 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 police and it took them a while to come. Two hours to three hours. The sex offender was taking the girl and it's like nobody cares, even though we report they don't look. We went to the president's office and we asked them if they, they would set up an Amber Alert. They told us she was too old. She they can't. Years old yeah. yeah. There's always Amber Alerts issued for non-custodial parents. So if a child's in danger, I sit on the Budget and Finance Committee and also the Chairwoman of the Sexual Assault Prevention Subcommittee. That committee was established back in 2016. The nation, we suffered a severe loss of um, Ashton Mike. Um, she was taken from her home and um, sexually assaulted and murdered. There's a lot of offenders out there who get to reoffend and move on to other children in the family. We provide medical services for children and adults who have concerns of child sexual abuse or sexual assault. And I'm here, boots on the ground, seeing, and I'm finding out all kinds of things about the family and the history and how vulnerable they are. I don't know that there's any child sex abuse case that is ever an easy case. So when you have a child witness that in and of itself, you know, presents unique challenges. It comes down to, can I prove the elements beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury? 
I have to say, all this time I've been here, I can't tell which cases are going to get a response and which ones aren't. It's, we don't get feedback. And I've been to federal court once for a child sex abuse case. So I, I know by now I should have gone many, many more times, several times a month. I met Christine early in 2015, and um, she shared with me the challenges that, that she's been having trying to navigate the criminal justice system. Um, there is no justice, <laughs> not within the Navajo Nation, not within the state, not within the federal courts. Um, as soon as I found out, as soon as my son told me that the police report, and um, and then the FBI agent told me that you know, there was a confession and that he was going to forward the prosecution, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. I mean, we had a perpetrator confess, and then the U.S. attorney said that there was insufficient evidence. Uh, I, was, I was thought that maybe we were the only ones going through this, and why isn't anybody listening? Why is anybody doing anything? Why is anybody helping? And I think that it happens almost in every family. I would say that we haven't really appreciated the effects of, of colonization of the boarding school. It's like been one thing on top of another on top of another. Children, uh, families, I should say, families, some families, the eighth generation were in boarding schools. We know that when there is a history of child sexual abuse, that there are cycles of, of abuse that can occur. Those kind of behaviors are learned and they can be repeated or reinforced in different ways. They're just little, little victims. You know, they're just little victims everywhere. Anybody can do anything to them and they've been violated in so many ways anyway that what's sexual abuse? You know, it's like one more thing that's going to happen to them. And like in our communities, the perpetrator stays you know, within the home or within the community. I feel like I blame myself for not taking better care of him. He doesn't come home a lot. I just think that it must be really traumatic for him to come here. That's the challenge is if these cases are not prosecuted, then there's no protection to the victim survivor. Um, and also these individuals then are not registered as sex offenders. And so we don't know if there's a habitual type do have an initiative called um, Save a Child, Heal the Nation, in recognizing uh, the type of trauma that our people have experienced and understanding what does that mean to be a trauma informed nation. And when people ask me, well, what's the outcome? For me, it's healing. And the reason why I say healing is because I cannot depend on an investigator or a court system to provide or to make that person whole. I see what's available spiritually and the ceremonies when they're, they're explained to me and the prayers. Oh my God, there's a wealth of healing there. Just being connected to the land in a way that we're not at all, those of us who live in the city. And that's very healing. And that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that video is on YouTube. And if you're interested in parts of that video, if it went too fast, um, you can find it. It's called Little Victims Everywhere. And like I said, it's on YouTube. So I know the title that, you know, everybody saw was across, you know, in tribal uh, communities. But what I can talk about is what we've experienced here the, the program, the Family Advocacy Center, 
here in Fort Defiance. And that's what I'm gonna to present to you today, of the experiences that um, we've had here um, being a new program in this community. So if you look at this map, this is an IHS map and it has the Navajo Nation. And here we are in Fort Defiance. And you can see right here, this is the border between New Mexico and Arizona. And right here, this is the border between Arizona and Utah. There, here's Colorado. So according to the map and what's officially recognized, Navajo Nation is in mostly located uh, in these three states and mostly in Arizona. And what you see here are we, in Fort Defiance, we see children and adults. And Gallup, which is not on the Navajo Nation, but is close by, 40 minutes away, they also see children and adults. And what I'm saying is that these are, uh, ours is a family advocacy center, Gallup, it's like a SANE program. And, um, and it's run by Gene Proper and it's out of GIMC, Gallup Indian Medical Center. And then if you look over here at Crown Point, if, if anybody's on the, in, the, in this presentation on chat, if you wanna let us know, because we heard that they do see some cases there, but that's why that's a question mark, because I don't, I don't think it's something that's uh, reliably there. In other words, there's, it comes and goes in terms of like who's there and who can do the cases. And then here we have Shiprock and Shiprock, the stars, the asterisks mean that they see adults, sexual assault. And in Farmington, let me put on my glasses so I can see, Farmington they can, is where people have to go if they're in this area and they want to be seen. Here's Farmington. If they want to, if they're children and they want to be seen. And I believe the staff in Farmington will travel to Shiprock to see the adults. And then over here, um, here is Chinley. And Chinley sees adults. And oh, sorry. And then here's Tuba City, and they also have a SANE program, and they definitely see adults. And depending on who's on call, they may have somebody who can see children. So you can see that when it comes to kids in most in Navajo Nation itself, really we're about the only program that consistently provides emergency and scheduled evaluation. So we see kids from all over come here to Fort Defiance because as you may know, most of child sexual abuse does not present as an emergency. It's an appointment that we can make because by the time children tell us about what's happened to them, it's too late essentially to do evidence collection. They're telling us weeks, months, years after the last incident. So, and I wanna show you, this is a picture of my, of where I work. This is taken from the, the ridge behind the hospital. This is the hospital housing. All these red roofs here are the hospital housing. And then right here, this is the hospital itself. But I love it here. It's beautiful. I took mostly a picture of the sky because it's so beautiful. And these are the, the red rocks. You can't really see them. They're more over here. But the, there's you can see a little of the red rocks and the mountains and stuff. But it's just beautiful. So and this is where I get to live and work and to go for walks in the dog with the dogs up here on this ridge. So this is the. Hey, Renee, uh, we have a question um, uh -huh. in the chat. Is it possible to show the population density to see where the majority of people residing in those highlighted areas in the map that you showed? Uh, no, that it's it's just a, let me go back to it's just a regular map. It doesn't have anything about population density in it. It can, this is Hopi, you can see that this is Hopi. These are the, this is the unit, the service units. This is an old IHS map. So it's showing you all the different Cayenta service unit, Shiprock service unit, Chinley service unit. Um, here's Fort Defiance service unit. I'm not sure what this is part of down here, but this is also um, part of Navajo Nation. So, so no, I can't tell you where the, the density is. What would I say? It's spread out all over. That's a whole nother story. But let me go on. Sorry. Okay, so let me tell you about the Family Advocacy Center. What we do here, we provide emergency and scheduled medical evaluations. 
So pretty much anything related to child sexual abuse and sexual assault, we can see here. Um, but when we do respond to an emergency, you can be assured that you will have a provider and an advocate, which is unique about this program because most programs, if you talk to them, the advocates don't necessarily go out with the provider um, to all cases. Um, but uh, for us, that's just how our system works. As soon as an, a provider gets activated, so does the advocate. And then um, forensic evidence collection is done by the provider and we also do the treatment. So that's a sexual assault evidence kit and we collect the clothing and um, they can take a shower when they're here and we have clothing that we can give them that's brand new. Um, so, and then they can get their antibiotics and their treatment, their HIV prophylaxis. So all the treatment that goes along with sexual assault, child sexual abuse, they can expect to get it here. And it's a, a 24 seven emergency medical service. So we have a call schedule. We share call with Chinley and with uh, GIMC. And, but as I said before, Chinley, they can see the adults, you know, somebody who is post pubertal. So for a girl, that's, you know, someone who has started their menses and for a boy, when they have secondary sexual characteristics, usually you can tell that their voice has changed. You don't have to get them undressed. You can ask them. And so then if they got those secondary sexual characteristics, they can go, they can be seen by a provider who sees adults. Otherwise, they're considered a child and they have to come here to Fort Defiance or they can go to Gallup. Um, I do take time off and uh, sometimes we're not here. And that's why it's useful to refer to the call schedule and you can see where it is that you need to send somebody um, by looking at our, call, uh, at our call schedule. And just let me say, I'm about to introduce Chris uh, Don Jilly, she's our nurse and she is newly certified in both peds and sane and she's just doing a few more cases to get those under her belt and then you can expect to see her on the call schedule and she'll be able to see both children and adults. And then, you know, we do follow up appointments as medically indicated. So for um, sexual assault, we generally see them, you know, at least three visits at two weeks two to four months, and then at six months is our last visit, and that's to do laboratory testing with the last HIV testing being at six months, and then, but then different things come up, and the, the, so we need to make referrals, help them with resources, that's what the advocates do, I have these, um, there's these amazing advocates I'm going to introduce you to that do a lot of that work, but the two-week check is to just check in and see how they're doing. We get some baseline labs, but you know, if they, a lot of the uh, people we see here have had trauma before, severe trauma. And then this, this sexual assault just add, just triggers all of those memories and maybe some of the uh, coping mechanisms that they had before like cutting or even suicidal ideation can come back. And so that's why we need to, or drinking or, so we try to see them within two weeks after that uh, initial visit when it's sexual assault, just to check in on them and see how people are doing. Are they working? Are they not? What do they need? So that's an important visit also. And then when it comes to ch the children, child sexual abuse, usually it's a one-time visit. They come at one and they don't leave till five or six. It's all afternoon. It's a comprehensive evaluation, talking to the parents, the caretakers, whoever that might be, and then talking to the child, doing a medical exam, and then doing labs. But because they are already, like I said before, weeks, months, even years past the time that this happened to them, they're out of crisis usually. So, um, so it can usually just be that one visit. So who do we have as staff? Well, we have Stephanie Perkins, who's one of the advocates and Lynette Gilmore is the other advocate. These are the stars of our program because this is what makes our program work. Our, our advocates who keep in touch with our patients, follow up, they figure out what people need and get it for them. They've done, that's a whole nother presentation. All the amazing things that these advocates have done to help the community and specifically our patients. 
Chris Don Gilly, I just told you about her. She's from Pennsylvania. She's our, our nurse. She is recently certified in SANE Adolescent Adult and in Pediatrics, and you can expect to see her name on our call schedule. She, all of us are older women. I mean, I hope nobody's going to get offended, but we're all like in 40s and older. So these are all mature women with a lot of experience that they're bringing to this work. That's been a blessing. That's been a blessing that I've been able to recruit women of such high caliber to do this work here. It's not to say that young blood wouldn't be bad. It would be good. In fact, if we had some younger staff. And so um, I was just glad that these people applied, you know, when the positions opened up. Um, and then I'm uh, the director of the program and a provider, and we have an admin assistant. And when I created this PowerPoint, we didn't have anybody hired in, but now we do. And actually her first day is next Monday. We're so excited that somebody else is going to answer the phone and do the copying and just help us figure out our lives, all the scheduling that has to happen. So we're very excited about that. This is our staff and you can tell we took this picture at Christmas and we're all wearing masks, but just so that you can see us without our masks. So this is me and now I cut my hair. I, my hair fell out, so now I cut my hair. Uh, this is Steph, she's the, the, one of the advocates. This is Chris, she's the nurse for our team. And this is Lynn, who is the other advocate for our team. And this is the whole gone in front of the oops in front of the hospital. Well, it's not in front of the hospital; it's in back of the hospital. But it's the whole gone that we use for that we're allowed to use that um, the traditional practitioners use for the hospital community. Okay, now um, one of the things I love about being here, this place, I'm just so fortunate that I was able to come here when I did and that I will probably finish out my career working here. It's a blessing because I've never worked in a place where culture was so appreciated. And when I first got here, my boss, Dr. Tut, Michael Tut said, you know, cause I'm telling him, you know, these rooms you need to make them welcoming. It's like, we're in a regular clinic. It doesn't look like the traditional advocacy center. So um, he said, well, you can have artwork done. You can, um, we, we will pay that you can have it in your budget and you can get artwork on the wall. So these are murals. All of our rooms have murals in them. And th this is the, these are the murals that are um, on all four walls. So if you look down here, you can see all four walls and they're the colors of the directions. So, um, so yellow is the, uh, well, let me just, is the sun going down? Let me, I don't know if I can show you mine. Okay, so this is my office. No, I can't show you the murals in my office, but I have female rain in the north and in the south I have um, clouds. So um, in the, and on the, and on the left-hand side, I have the sunrise. So, um, and these, the mountains that you see, are all representative of the mountains that surround us here in Fort Defiance. And in the exam room, they have the four sacred mountains. Um, so I don't have, let's see if maybe it's this next one. No, this is the family room. This is actually Lynn's office. And this is a, you can see these are animals that live here um, on Navajo Nation. And you can, um, so we have deer and buffalo and, uh, and there's eagles. So, um, so this is all done to, so that when patients can come in, they see a place that is familiar. They see mountains that are familiar. They can feel safe. They can feel contained. They are in the place that starts their healing because they are surrounded by familiar images. I talked to the, um, one of the traditional practitioners when I first got here and I asked him, what can I do to make a, create a, a welcoming atmosphere. And I don't know, let me try and see if you can see what we're here. I have, uh, let me show you. I got these at the swap meet. So these are, because they're so cute, I have to show you. They're little like mm, Pendleton looking animals. 
And those are horses. And here's my, I'm so bad at this. Here's my donkey. I have these in here for the kids to play with. And I have, and he said to wear turquoise. He says, wear a piece of turquoise. And so that kids know that you're, um, you're part of the community that serves them. And um, because as you know, now I'm Mexican. And so I've learned, it's so important to learn all the things that help you serve a community and that help you make children comfortable. And when I was doing this work out in Albuquerque, I rarely got disclosures and now I know why. I mean, kids will look at you like you're crazy. What are you talking to me about that for? Like, I'm not gonna talk, tell you, I don't know who you are. But once I came here and I put all those things in place, and um, I started talking to children. I'm, I'm, you know, still, you can't always get a disclosure from a child, but I have to say, it's a lot easier now that I'm here and they're coming to a hospital, a setting that's familiar to them. It has made all the difference. And so, and I've also, we participate, well, we'll talk about it in a, a little bit more, but it's, it's also been very important to participate in the community doings, the, the marches that happen, the arts and crafts fairs that have everything. I think that has been an important part of being in the community also is understanding, you know, what happens here and um, and being a part of that. And, and like going to the, um, I'm trying on in September, it's the, tell me Kelsey, what's it called? Um, Navajo Nation Fair going to the different fairs. I haven't been to the one in Shiprock, which I hear is a really good one, but um, I hope to do that. You know, maybe once COVID stops, if it ever stops. So uh, let me just show you some of the numbers, okay? And when you look at these uh, charts, these are all the cases that we've seen for child sexual abuse starting in 2016 to 2021. This is a lot of information, but I'll just, show it to you just, you know, so age groups five to broken down five to 10, 11 to 17, and then 18 and older, because people who are developmentally delayed are treated medically in the same way that we treat a child with child sexual abuse, very gently, very carefully, extra time, they bring their caregiver, we need to know how they communicate and use the tools that they use to communicate, so you, there, and there is a developmentally delayed population, people with disabilities here on Navajo Nation, of course, and they're particularly vulnerable. So you'll see that every year we see a number of patients who fall into this category. So that, that, that's the categories here. Here you see the numbers and we've divided it into male and female. And then down here, you see the totals. So, um, as you look through this, you'll see, okay, so in 2016, and you'll see always there's a significant number of boys, you know, and, and that is different for me because I have to say, I have never seen so many boys as I, for child sexual abuse as I have since I've been here. It's a whole nother discussion. But you can see our numbers here. And, and, and mind you, 2016, I didn't start seeing children in 2016 till we were halfway through the year in the summer of 2016 and we saw 33 in 2017 we saw 49 in 2018 50 um, in 2019 36 and then here's covid so covid oh no i'm sorry 2020 it's we saw 30 and then in 2021 it's covid so Right now we're working on the numbers for 2021, but we saw 47 total for 2020, uh, for 2021, which makes for a total of 246 children, okay? Total that we've seen since we've been here. And then these are the um, sexualists, these are the adults that we've seen. And again, you can see the numbers and again, um, we divided them into male and female, and um, you can see the total numbers. I didn't break them down. We're not, they're not broken down into age groups. Well, they are, but that's another, that's in our database. If you wanted that information, you could write to me and 
and I would um, I could give that to you. But we I've seen so overall when you look at both children and adults, I've seen children as young as six months old and adults as old as 76. I think the most elderly person we saw was 76. And that's for a total of 128. So um, looking at both of these, let me just go back. We, we see out of a total of, I thought I had these numbers, but uh, 246 plus, um, 128, that's 300, almost 400, like say 375 patients. And in the time that we've been here and two thirds of them are children. They're, we see, you know, almost out of, we see three times, no, twice as many children as we do adults. So that's not, that was not something I was expecting when I came out here either. But um, it just goes to show what the, what the need is. It really is in providing services to children. So many children out there that uh, something has happened to. So let me, let's talk a little bit more about what have been some of the challenges. And I'll bet this isn't just true here, but I'm sure it's true in other tribal communities. Um, although I, can, I don't know, I can't say that really, because I don't know, I've only been here. But, you know, working in Albuquerque, there's, we saw patients from the Pueblos and the, you know, there's like 12 Pueblos in New Mexico. And uh, there was a number of patients, you know, families that told me about these same kinds of problems. So um, one of the challenges is poor co coordination and communication between law enforcement and child protective services. When it comes to children, there is a federal mandate and Navajo Nation has a mandate. It says that there will be cross-reporting. In other words, law enforcement will cross-report to Child Protective Services when they have the case, and the same is true for Child Protective Services. They will let law enforcement know when they have a case, but that doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen in a timely manner. I think it happens when they need something from each other. So it used to be when I was working in the state of New Mexico, I could send a report just to um, the hotline and that I met with my duty to report. And it was, I knew it was gonna end up, they would research it and figure out whose jurisdiction was and they'd get the report to law enforcement. And also, and then sure enough, you know, a day later, sometimes even the same day, I would get a phone call from whosoever case it was assigned to. Now that I'm here, that doesn't happen. So you know what we do? We, when we have a case and we're gonna report, and I would suggest this for anybody who's working with it, having this problem, you just send a report to everybody. Child sexual abuse is a felony, major felony. Um, and what it means is that the FBI gets involved. So when we have a case, a child sexual abuse case, we fill out the scan form, sexual, um, what's it called? It's a child abuse reporting form. Uh, child abuse and neglect reporting form. We fill that out and we send it to the FBI, PD, local police department, the criminal investigator unit, and also the FBI. So you have to find out which, like in Arizona, if, the, if it happened in Arizona, it goes to the FBI side of the Arizona side of the FBI. The Gallup office is divided into Arizona and New Mexico. So you, you, if it happened in New Mexico in Crown Point, it's gonna go to the FBI side in, um, in Gallup uh, that serves New Mexico. And then you have to figure out you know, who the Child Protective Services, uh, uh, where their office is and who's responsible there, their fax number. You have to get all this information together. And, and you know what I would suggest? Letting them all know on that cover sheet that this is who you're sending it to. So everybody knows that everybody else knows. I think it's a really good way to make sure that, you know, at least those of us who do the medical part are, um, are facilitating communication. Uh, another challenge has been that there's not uh, regular training or updates. I've talked to, I've been in a couple committees and I understand that really officers, uh, the, you know, police department level and criminal investigators, they pretty much have to go on their own to training. There's not money in the budget that, that provides annual training. 
So I have come across not just um, law enforcement, but also first responders, EMS, that do victim blaming, which is a really old school way of looking at this issue of sexual assault. And that is, that's still here. And I think that is a reflection of the training that's not offered. There's not any updates. There's all these new approaches um, to talking to people who have been through trauma. There's all this new information about the neurobiology of trauma and how it affects uh, how somebody um, uh, relates, uh, how would I say not relates, communicates what it is that happened to them. And people aren't aware of it. People who are frontline are not aware of that. The other problem is another challenge has been that there's too many links in the chain. The cases, PD takes the initial report and then they pass it on to the criminal investigator and the criminal investigator is kind of the liaison between uh, uh, Navajo Nation and the FBI. So that's a problem. Like it's like that, that game you play of telephone. If the PD does victim blaming, I'm not saying that they all do, I'm saying, but just say in this one instance, they're kind of minimizing the account that's being given. How does that get communicated to CI? How is CI going to communicate that if they communicate it to the FBI? So do you see it's, it's because my, one problem has been that I can't count on everybody getting the same kind of information, the same quality of information. I can count on one hand how many times an FBI agent has called me to, to, to go over a case. They usually call me about children. I don't think, I'm gonna say it, I don't think they've ever called me about an adult to go over a case that was an adult, just the children. So see, I don't, I don't know. It's, this is one of the problems here. Failure to move cases through from investigation onto prosecution. Now you can kind of see, now that I've talked about this poor communication, poor coordination of the investigation, I'm used to law enforcement calls, social worker, hey, we're gonna go talk to this family, do you wanna go? Or social services usually is the one who calls law enforcement and says, I have to go talk to this family, figure out if the rest of the kids are safe, do you wanna come? You know, and they say, yes, of course I want to come. I don't want you to ruin my crime scene or, you know, talk to somebody who could be a suspect. You know, they, they go together to go work these cases. And, and if you don't, then you're not getting firsthand information. Everybody's coming in at different points to figure out what's going on. And then how does that information go to prosecution? And there was recently a presentation, uh, Delegate Crotty, she was this, one of the people in the video um, where she asked for a report on the declination rate and they went over the declinations that, um, that they get and that Navajo Nation gets and that something like two, three years later, they're getting a declination. And that's when tribal um, jurisdiction can kick in as far as prosecution of the case. And that's going to be too late for most of the debt, for most of the requirements that you have to meet to prosecute a case. And the most common reason for dec dec uh, the declination was that there was insufficient evidence. Now, you heard what Christine Benali said. There was a confession in, in her specific case, and yet there was a declination in her case. So that's not my area. I can just tell you what I see from here. And, uh, and this, you know, if you wanted to know more about that, I think it's a matter of talking to the people, people who are in that arena when it comes to working these cases. Another consideration is geographic distances are long. Amazing, I'm amazed that anybody comes for appointments. Oh my God, like people will drive hours to come, to, they'll wake up at four in the morning to come. That's why our appointments are at one in the afternoon. And when they say the roads are bad and it's muddy, yeah, I never appreciated that until I came here. And then I realized driving down the road, there's all these cars parked on the road. Why? Because they can't get into their houses. And if they get into their houses, they're not going to be able to get out to go to work the next day. So there's all these houses, there are all these cars parked and there's no houses anywhere that you can see. They must be get their boots on and like walk all the way in. It's, it's insane. It's just the geographic distances. We need drones that can pick people up, 
helicopters that can pick people up and bring them where they need to be. I mean, I don't know what we're going to do, but there's, so what happens with those long response, those long distances, a long response time for, for all agencies to get to these families. You heard what um, Alice said, it took two to three hours for them to get out there when she called them and said, Hey, they, they're gone. He took her again. Like you have to come. It took two or three hours. I've had patients tell me I couldn't get a ride. And uh, so I called and they said that the officer was out way far away. They couldn't get to me that I needed to get myself to the gas station and that they would pick me up at the gas station. That's close. So, so yeah, it's like, you know, here are these, these poor, these victims trying to get in to get services and transportation, just basic transportation infrastructure. And that's the next slide as a huge challenge. So yeah, poor infrastructure, Wi-Fi that, you know, we take that for granted. If you live in the city, you take that for granted. I'm, when I go to Albuquerque, it's like, oh my God, I can get Wi-Fi anywhere, driving down the street. Out here, no, that's, that's just not true. I learned out here, you have to text. That's easy, you can get a hold of people easier through text. And we ended up getting cell phones for the advocates so they could text their patients. And they can almost always get a response by text, but not by phone call. So it's not just, you know, the internet. It's also just basic cell service. There's, and there's no Uber here. There's no Lyft here that you can call somebody and they're gonna come get you and, and take you where you need to go. And who has the money for that anyway? So there's no reliable public transportation system. I think there's two buses you know, two times a day, the bus goes between Gallup and here. I don't know because I don't take the bus, but that's what I understood. Um, the roads are, you know, the main roads are paved, but, and they do keep them, you know, they get out there and they ice them, you know, they, they what do they call it? They put down stuff so that they're not icy. 911, when I moved, you know what they told me? There's no 911, you, you can call, but who knows? No, if something happens to me in my cozy little Beverly Hills of hospital housing, I call security. I call my security here for the hospital. That's, that's who I call if I need something. So that's been a challenge. Um, there's insufficient support services. And here I think I'm preaching to the choir. All of you know there's not enough advocates. There's not enough shelters. There's not enough mental health services. There's no groups. You know, I took it for granted. The Group therapy, a lot of teenagers and adults love group therapy because, you know, and they have it for sexual assault, for parents of children who were sexually abused. In other communities, you can get that. And yeah, it's great because you can go to these meetings um, and you can hear what other people say. And if you don't want to talk, you don't have to. And you'll learn something, you'll get something from it because you can get support from the people that are there. And you can say, oh, that happened to them six months ago. Oh, that happened to them six years ago. Oh, so I can see where I fit in this, you know, how I'm going to feel. So it's really important. Drug and alcohol rehab services. I've had patients relapse waiting to get into, into rehab and they want their kids back and they want to work their program, but it's just, you know, they're, what do they tell you? You know, I come from a family of alcoholics. They tell you, you have to get out of your community because those, those, what's, I don't know, what, what did my daughter say? It's something like, old habits and old people drag you down. Like you end up, you know, using again because you're in, uh, you're back where these problems started. And there's no local 24 hour helplines. You can't call somebody in Window Rock or in Shiprock or some, you know, to talk to somebody. A lot of times, if you could even just get somewhere, you can make a phone call and call a 24, that can be a lifesaver. You know, just being able to talk to somebody. Victims are hesitant to report because they tell us this, you know, they just get away with it here. So, you know, why bother? Nothing ever happens. Um, there's a lot of concerns about confidentiality and privacy about their trauma, about what they've been through. And, you know, some of our patients work here or they have, you know, their kids come here and they work here. So if we take their pointers. They told us, you know, why don't you put that sofa behind the bookcase, because then I can sit here and people walking down the hall can't see me. And yeah, we did that. So yes, and we have a way of doing our record so that we're not in the electronic record because what would you do if your son 
or daughter was accused of sexual abuse and you had access to the appointment that you know your grandchild had and you really truly believe that they didn't do this thing how you know you would give up your job if they fight all the things that are in place kick in after you looked at those records they so no you so i have been supported in in working here and keeping things confidential by not having our our records, which means that our patients don't go, don't register. They come straight back here. We do the registration. Everything is maintained in our in our office. And there's a few more steps we could take to to you know keep it even more confidential and private. But you know the the problem is space, just like everybody else has. There's just not enough space to accommodate you know the rooms that we would need to be and the and the way we would have to set up our our center so that we could assure that kind of privacy. But this is a huge reason why people don't come back. They come to us in crisis, but then once they're on, they're starting to feel better. They don't necessarily come back for their appointments because their cousin works in the clinic. And I've seen it. That's when I first came here and I saw it. I thought, oh my God, we're going to have to do something about this because people know each other in the hall, in the common areas. Oh, hi, how are you? How's grandma? Does she know? Oh, are you here picking up meds? Oh, who's that for? I mean, like everybody's talking about everything, right? In the common areas. And, you know, we have, our patients are traumatized and they're in crisis. They don't want to deal with that. So we had to figure something out. So what are the strengths? I mean, I could go, I only have 10 more minutes. I could go on about this forever. Okay. I'm an outsider. I am an outsider. And I thought I understood you know, it, Native American culture, because I lived in Albuquerque and I, you know, but I grew up in LA and I, I, I know nothing until I know nothing. I still don't know very much. So, but I'm learning and they have this thing that's called lunch and learn. And I go to all of those that I can. And I would suggest anybody who's not Native American, especially whatever community you're working in, you need to go any day. If they don't have it, you need to ask them to put those on so that you can learn, like I missed the moccasin story on Monday, but that's, they tell you about weddings and the Penalta and just all these different things. You have to, you have to learn about that stuff because you're gonna miss out on, you're not gonna understand so much of what people are talking about and, and how things have affected them unless you've tried to learn some of those basic things. So like, look, they have Miss Navajo Nation. Oh my God, I went, Lynn took me to the first time I went to that. I, these poor girls all dressed in their beautiful outfits. They're just their finery and their jewelry and they're cutting the sheet open and they're, you know, taking off the skin and they're opening it up and taking out the guts. I mean, I'm a doctor. I know about anatomy and, and they're doing it right there in front of all of us. And here's all these grandmas sitting in the very front. And I don't know what they're saying, but they're like, no, no, no. Oh, we did that. Oh, they're just like these poor girls. There's all these people watching them and criticizing them. Those poor things. I don't know. But it was a beautiful, amazing thing. And that was just that part of it. You know, I, there's all these other things that they have to do. They have to speak the language. You have to answer all these. And then they're asking them all these questions about their culture while they're trying to do this. It was a, it was like. It's like, uh, not hazing, but it's like a mil like being in the military or something where they're just asking you all these things. So that, that's, that's just amazing that, that, they, that that exists is amazing. And people will come up to me and say, she was Miss Navajo. And they'll tell me about all the people who are Miss Navajo before. It's, it's an honor that you carry for the rest of your life, you know, more than Miss America. I mean, Miss America has got nothing on Miss Navajo. So, and then the Canalda ceremony, um, that's a puberty ceremony for girls, all the Navajo cultural stories, amazing stories that are there that ground people. Why is this a strength? Because this is what brings people back to who they are. This is what brings the children back to who they are. They've been just torn apart, adults that are just torn apart, but they have this culture that they can come to and reground themselves in and they can have their traditional healing practices, the prayers, the ceremonies, the rituals, all of those things are what heals and what brings a person back to who they are and where they come from and who their family is and 
this is their place. This is their land. This is their place. And all of this reinforces that. So yes, having livestock and having family land, having land that you go to in the summertime, do you know, for your, with your light, with your sheep and your livestock living in homesteads, like these poor kids, they come and they draw, you know, they have them over here at Hogan Hojoni, which you're not even supposed to have orphanages now, but that's essentially what it is. And they're drawing pictures of the corral and the, where the water is, and you know, the Hogan's here and the house is here. And like, oh my God, because that's what they're missing is, is their home and where their family is. Um, children, here's another straight. Children are valued and appreciated as the future of a people. Not, not just, oh, this is my child. I love them, you know, of course, and they're just wonderful. No, every child, every child, every young person, every teenager, they're all valued and appreciated as the future, which is not in American society, not even in Mexican society, you know, really. Strong and binding family connections. Kids, if there is anybody in a family on either side of their family, maternal or paternal, that is competent, that's where these kids end up. They, I mean, these relationships, like I'm, I'm married to her cousins, uh, I'm married to her cousin and, or not even like that, that's too close. It's like distant distance, there's not even, you know, Mexican way, they'd all be cousins. Mexi they'd all be aunts and uncles and cousins. Here they're all like, I got totally confused with this one patient because she kept saying her grandpa or grandpa. And then when I look back at my notes, I realized she had, she said he was dead. Well, no, she was talking about grandpa was her grandma's um, sister's husband. That's her grandpa. And I knew that. I knew that everybody has a lot of grandmas and grandpas, but I didn't clarify that. So if you're doing this work, you know, just you have to dig deeper to find out. And if the child can't, the ch children can tell you like the de details of the relationship. But um, if not, you have to go talk to the adults. So these amazing family connections where children get to end up living with their family, which is which is everything, you know, for these children. And then the sense of duty and responsibility to community. That's why, you know, our numbers were high in the beginning when it came to COVID. Well, we were 80% vaccinated by when the vaccines came into effect within two months of the vaccine being in effect, we were 80% vaccinated. That's not anywhere else. And that's because the president said, you will get vaccinated and because of your responsibility to your community, to the people in your house, to the people at the post office, to the people at the store, your community. You, there's no question, there's no marches here or people anti-vaxxers here. There's no such thing. And then let me do this fast. There's an, a celebration appreciation of the arts and artistic abilities. That's, that is creativity, expressing yourself with art, that's another sign of resilience. And that's another strength that helps people heal. There's a respect for elders. That's a strength in this community. A respect, a respect for elders slash leaders. Because if your leader, you know, is who you go to, they're directly accountable to you. That's who you, who you go to for problems. They bring them forward. Leadership. I am fortunate to work with leaders like Delegate Crotty and leaders before her, other women who brought attention to the issues of child sexual abuse and sexual assault. And then there's a community of like-minded organizations for, and we support each other. So Strengthening Families has a bunch of programs for, uh, you know, like Althea has got a place in heaven somewhere because she does an amazing amount of work. One person that serves this area, she does a protection order. She helps people go get their clothes. She goes with them to court so many more things that I can't even tell you about she helped deliver food you know uh during COVID so uh strengthening families is an amazing program that's Navajo Nation program MM uh, missing and murdered Diné relatives that's another program that has roots everywhere a lot of um activists and support from uh the community and then Nas Casa Nas Casa Navajo Apache Ute Hopi Zuni Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. This group is a coalition of all of the people that I just named 
Whoever wants to belong to that group that does work in sexual and domestic violence can belong. And this, and we all support each other in each other's events and flyers and job postings, everything. So I've never been at a, in a place. I'm 65 years old. I worked in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and then Albuquerque. Never did I see this kind of support that there is here as a community of people who care and work on these kinds of issues. And then I have finally, I have been fortunate to have the support of Dr. Tut, Michael Tut, and the Fort Defiance Indian Hospital Board who approved this position. And they didn't know they were getting me, but maybe they did, I don't know, but they brought me out here and they started this place, this family advocacy program that, that they get to make decisions like that. And that it's not about money or, you know, we don't, we don't make anybody any money, but that the service is what's important. That is the other thing the, that's unique to doing this work here. I have, I am blessed. I am blessed and honored to be able to finish my career here um, at, at San Francisco Medical Center. And with that, this is a picture that Lynn took. It's the Hogan that's at the museum. Um, thank you, Lynn, for my closing slide. Alrighty, thank you so much, Renee. That was so much information and uh, you made me miss home. You made me miss my, my grandpa's homestead. And <laughs> I was just like, oh, everything, yes. <laughs> um, so now we're gonna open up to any questions or comments that anybody has. Um, you know, you're welcome to raise your hand and I can unmute you if you wanna have any spoken comments or com conversations. Um, and Renee, if you wanna look in the chat, you got a lot of remarks during your, your presentation around, um, you know, the beautiful artwork, the, um, it was a twin sisters in Monument Valley, I think was seen on one of the paintings. And I just made a comment about how Navajo Nation areas do not really have street names or you don't have house numbers. So when you're responding, when law enforcement responds, they can't find it. Um, that's the, I know that's true for Blue Gap area because that's where my dad, my grandpa's from. Um, you have Alice saying it was funny that you mentioned Patients need a drone. I traveled from Farmington and I picked up a hitchhiker on their way to an appointment in Shiprock. People rely on the mercy of others on the road and it's pretty sad. Yeah. If you haven't, I mean, I haven't seen hitchhikers. I went to Hawaii when I was in college. They had hitchhikers there. We hitchhiked because we were backpacking. I didn't, haven't seen hitchhiking until I came here, until I came to Melbourne. That's what you have to do. You have to hitchhike sometimes to get places and they hold out money to tell you I'll pay for gas, you know, if you give me a ride. But I was told when I first got here, don't pick up any hitchhikers. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I was like, if I had a truck, I'd let them get in the back. But, but yeah, people are, I mean, I, ha I, I mean, people have stopped me at the post office and asked if I could give them a ride to the hospital. Yes, I give them a ride to the hospital because, you know, they're usually elderly or a ride to the chapter house, you know, and yes, I do give them a ride there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, it doesn't look like we have any comments or questions. So thank you so much, Renee, for all of your wealth and knowledge. And if anybody wants any contact information, you're more than welcome to reach out and we'll get you in touch. Um, Alice, you covered a lot of topics and it was just the tip of the iceberg. You and your staff absolutely rock. Thank you. Yeah, Rachel says thank you. Laura says thank you. A descending heart. <laughs> all righty. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you all on Thursday for our Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Task Force of Colorado. Um, and if you're not registered, please do so. And I look forward to seeing you all there. Bye, everybody. Good luck. Do good job. Do good work. <laughs> Bye.